me and uh, three of my grad students, uh, Ashley Dover, Darren Guinness, and Alvin Jude. So I figured at least I'll, I'll help dedicate one slide to a little bit of history since pretty much everyone here is pretty familiar with gestural interaction and all these next generation interfaces. But for the most part, we're talking about leveraging gestures from our body to interact with given interaction styles, whether it be VR uses, whether it be your typical desktop metaphor, whether it be anything that we can think of or imagine. Now, this concept has been studied for well over 30 years, from the beginnings when we had put it there to a lot of these newer next generation interfaces that are coming out currently. And for the most part, we're able to divide this interaction into two basic types. The first one being the requirement to wear some form of glove or hardware in order to measure our hand or some form of gesture to do the interaction. The other one, which is the one I'm going to be mainly focusing on, is called touchless or mid-air gestures. These are gestures that uh, kind of leverage the come-as-you-are idea, where we use other kinds of hardware to measure the gesture or a given action that a user is attempting to do without any cumbersome equipment to be placed on the user. So basically, all they have to do is just come as they are, show up as with whatever they're wearing or using, and we don't have to strap any additional interactions on them. Now, for the most part, gesture has kind of been this little bit of a dream. Hollywood has kind of lied to us for a little bit and saying, oh, we, we are so close to this kind of interaction from Iron Man to Minority Report, just given this dream of interaction. But what we end up getting is something not quite up to snuff in that sense. But a lot of the hardware is getting closer and closer to this type of interaction. And we're seeing with the advancement of this hardware, this cheaper availability that is allowing us to do a lot of these interactions. And mid-air interaction has had a lot, of, a lot of usages that are just now starting to be explored. The first of which is being medical interactions in sterile, uh, in sterile environments, where doctors are able to look at different kinds of information without having to scrub in and out every single time that they go to look at any form of data on their patient. Um, there's also accessibility devices that allow us to do interaction in environments that people can't typically use the computer, the computer keyboard mouse that they would be normally used to using. Now, one of the big things about gesture is accuracy. And accuracy has been a large problem with gesture in terms of hitting close together targets, specifically when using mid-air gestures for pointing. Now, a lot of the current usages allow us to have interactions where our targets are spread out in large-scale large, large scale screens. However, as we begin to use these interactions in more and more applications, the targets are going to become a lot more dense. And even when we start to consider potentially swapping out our keyboard-mouse interaction with our gesture, then the targets are going to be even, even tighter in terms of how they're going to be interacting. Now, as you can see on the screen, there's, there's a number of dots I have right there. This is a perfect kind of example where you have a number of targets that could be potentially on a screen where you, and then you have one goal target, which in this case is the orange one, that would be the one that you were trying to aim for. That's going to be incredibly hard to hit given some form of gesture of just holding out your hand, mainly because you have a little bit of movement in your hand even when you're trying to hold still. So hitting a smaller target, specifically one that is surrounded by other options, is really hard to do. And we can extrapolate this even farther if you're trying to talk to about some of these current installations in the general public. So for these more uh, general gesture-based uh, museum exhibits, things where you're showing large amounts of data that you're trying to interact with, the targets can get smaller and smaller and smaller. And discerning which ones our users are trying to basically gesture towards is getting harder and harder. Now, the problem of hitting a target, specifically a dense target, has been investigated extensively using mice, which we're hoping, and our, our idea was to take some of the more successful implementations of the mouse accuracy uh, augmented cursors and push it to gesture. So, what we ended up going with was three, or basically two different augmented cursors and a default cursor. The first of which, the default point cursor, is the idea of just a, using it as a control base for our experiment. 
This is your typical cursor. As you can see, it's just signified by a simple X on our screen right there. And you're able to move it around just by holding out your arm and gesturing in any direction, and it will follow your arm accordingly. Now, it just has a single point of activation, meaning wherever that point is, when you do your selection, that is the only thing that is going to be, that's the only target that is going to be hit. There is no other way of kind of shifting from other targets without actually physically moving. The second of which is bubble cursor. Bubble cursor is this concept where it has a semi-transparent circular area that has a size that will vary so that it always has at least one target in its, in its sights. So as you move around, even if you aren't directly on a target, it will shift to the closest target that's available to still give you the option of potentially choosing that one, even without being directly on it. The last one is called bubble cursor. Oh, sorry, not bubble cursor, just that. The cursor, again, will, uh, it, it is surrounded, it works really well when it's surrounded in empty space. Uh, it does act a lot more like the, curse, the point cursor, the tighter a lot of clusters become. Uh, one example would be, so this is the example of what the bubble cursor looks like as we were actually using it within our study. This is just a sample study. This is not done with accuracy or speed, just to show you an, an example of what it looks like as you move it around the screen trying to identify various targets. So as you can see, the bubble cursor will actually grow and shrink depending on how close you get to the actual target. And at any given time, it always has at least one target in its sights. So where that leaves us, that leads us to the idea of bubble lens. Now, the bubble lens allows us, it, it takes a lot of the similar ideas from bubble cursor, but pushes it a little bit farther in the sense of when you get to closely surrounded targets, a static lens will show up around your given targets to allow you to have far more accuracy within a given cluster of targets. So what it uses is this idea of kinematic targeting. So as it continuously examines the velocity as you're moving around, and it can determine exactly when to push the lens on top and give you the option of what you can see. What you end up with is something that looks like this. So as you can see, as the as the bubble cursor still is moving around, as it gets closer to the cluster of, of targets that you can get to, a lens will show up to give you a lot more accuracy in targeting when trying to hit that, in this case, center goal of a target inside of a smaller cluster. So what we tried to do, we, we did an experimental design where we focused on comparing the different performance between these, these cursors. We went with a 3x3x3 three by three by three within subjects design, where we had three different cursor types, three different target widths, and three different spacing levels of our targets that we were trying to hit. Within this experimental design, we decided to go, we had 18 participants, where we had 12 men, 6 women, that completed three rounds in one of our three orderings using a Latin, uh, Latin cube ordering scheme. Now, each of our rounds consisted of basically 16 trials. We had three of that were some practice to allow them to get used to the interaction, get used to basically the gesture that was associated with moving the cursor around and basically that interaction itself. And then each one of those had nine effective sizes in it. So as a whole, what, ended up, what each user had to go through was basically 351 individual trials that they were asked to perform. So this was a prolonged study, a study that lasted roughly about 55 to 60 minutes of them doing in mid-air arm gestures, which surprisingly enough, if you ever tried to hold out your hand for that long, can put an awful lot of strain. The nice thing is, is that we used a Mayo, and the Mayo allows the user to not only do a non-rusted, where you can hold out your arm and do what we call a grill arm, like so. But it also, if they become tired at any point, allows the user to place their elbow down and move their arm accordingly in order to rest whichever muscles they feel like are getting tired at that given point in time. Our system is able to handle both cases without any interruption of, of interaction or recalibration, which is really nice. Again, what we allow them to do is that we allow them to basically set up a space that they want to interact with. If they want to use very grand gestures, 
like our subject here is trying to do, they're more than welcome to. If they want to shorten that up and use smaller gestures, our system also allows them to tighten up the gestures and use smaller gestures to control where they are going. Now, the task itself was just an augmented version of our, the original bubble lens experiment that was done with the mice, where each of our trials required our participants to basically select and hit that orange goal as they move around. And in order to move to the next trial, they actually have to hit the selected goal. This is not timed in terms of they only have a certain amount of seconds to hit that target. We don't move to the next trial until they actually do hit their goal themselves. Now, the target selection was done as the keyboard gestural interaction when we used a, the space bar to do actual selection since the Mayo gesture itself to do selection was d deemed to be unreliable specifically when hitting really tight, uh, smaller uh, targets. Now, for the most part, what we, what we found is that we had to do a pilot study in order to identify what a small target was considered, because given on a mouse, a smaller target is going to be much smaller, much tighter than when you were talking about gesture. So when we ran our initial pilot study for, uh, with seven individual subjects, we found that a small target was considered 12, or two, 12 to 16 pixels. So we estimated about 16 pixels would be given a tight enough, small enough target where we would get some form of benefit. Uh, so we focused on movement time and, and error rate, and using those two, we actually took a look at, once we've run all of our subjects, and we found that overall, uh, the bubble lens actually performed much better than the point cursor, as so did the bubble cursor also perform much better than the point cursor. Unfortunately, uh, as you can see here, uh, there was, a, there was a, a decent amount of information that allowed us to, to kind of push forward. What we ended up running was that our, our movement time, we found that all of them were significant. Uh, we showed that all of the postdoc tests all showed significance. And we also found that the effect size also came out to be quite large for all of our interactions. Uh, the same was said for our error rate. All came back as significant amongst themselves, uh, and also a medium to large effect sizes moving forward. Uh, the last thing I want to mention, just because I'm really running out of time, I'm trying to push forward, is uh, we also performed a NASA, uh, the NASA TLX survey to do subjective feedback in terms of uh, mental demand, physical, all the, all the different uh, glorious parts of the NASA TLX. And we actually found that, uh, for the most part, uh, this, the bubble lens actually was rated much higher than all of the other ones. Uh, and, and actually, in terms of subjective feedback, it actually came out to be statistically significant beyond most of the other two as well. Uh, last but not least, we showed that we have an enhanced version. The bubble lens actually does really well. Uh, we recommend it. It's very, very, uh, very, very nice for any user trying to do gesture uh, to hit small clustered targets. Uh, a lot of additional work. I'm well over time, and I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Let's thank the speaker. So we have time for one question. Please come to the microphone. Yeah. Um, very interesting. I was just wondering. <laughs> It looks so confusing, the bubble pointer and the bubble lens. Did you sure. try the, a, a mix of just a normal pointer with a lens, which is something that obviously lots of people do with the mouse and other types of interaction? So we, uh, we attempted to do that. The problem is, is when it depends on the angle that they're coming in at. If you just use a cursor, specifically one where you're just doing just general hands, uh -huh. the lens will basically, depending on the velocity and the angle that you're coming into the target, you will basically hit a target and the lens will just a portion of what you're trying to hit, and it won't give you an appropriate lens size to what you're trying to, basically the target that you're trying to get to. Whereas if you combine both of them, the cursor and the bubble cursor and the bubble lens allows you to hit the proper target. Even with a lens that is uh, dependent on the, 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 the speed of approaching the target or not? Yes. Even with that? Even with that. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you. Please give another hand to the speaker.